didn't say to uh, exactly what kind of expert I am. First of all, I'm a friend of Michal Lorenz, so this is uh, <laughs> one of the most important expertise of mine that I've ever done. And uh, I can thank this uh, invitation and my very good relationship with the Bruno University. Uh, uh, we are very, very good friends, and uh, somehow we can. Um, work together and we, we try to work together as much as we can. Um, <coughs> will it be published this uh, video recording? Yes. Uh, openly? Yes. Okay, then but I will take it over what I'm saying. I wanted to speak about you know, feudalism in our country. Which is, uh, uh, about, uh, everything is about uh, good relationships, you know, you know, in Hungary, in the Czech Republic, and everywhere that I uh, stop this uh, conversation in this moment. <coughs> So what we will uh, speak about is uh, digitization and creative reuse of uh, cultural content. Um, unfortunately, I'm exactly not an exp expert in of digitization uh, as far as the technical things are concerned. What is much more uh, important in my mind is the strategic level of thinking on digitization. And I would like to present you something, uh, some of the European developments on uh, on the thinking of uh, of, uh, of digitization and how to to make digitization sustainable uh, in the uh, European Union countries. This will be the agenda of the, of uh, today's work. So we will start with uh, some uh, introduction. Uh, I will introduce you my university as well in a few uh, sentences. Then we will speak about the EU policies on digitization and digital preservation and you will get the answer uh, what, uh, what is the main focus of my, uh, of my work. Then I will show you some figures from uh, digitization uh, from the European Union countries. Uh, then we'll speak about the reuse of content and then some practices from Europe. So I will uh, show you some good examples of uh, how to reuse uh, cultural content in different ways and how to make digitization sustainable uh, via these different applications of uh, cultural content. And finally, uh, I hope we can have uh, time for open discussion and you will also open for open discussion. Uh, and if you have any questions or any comments, uh, it is certainly warmly welcome after the presentation. We have one and a half hour and uh, as I'm also a university teacher, uh, I know that uh, the most important thing in this uh, lecture is to stop it at the exact time. So uh, we, everybody has their own um, work and the, you like to go out to the city or, or do something what you want. There's a big festival in, in Brno. I love this city because uh, there are students everywhere and I especially love Kisk. It is not the first time when I, I came here. I, I had a lecture two or three years ago on topic maps and the semantic web. Uh, and then we then I experienced that this is a, a very vivid and and uh, lively city, and especially this department is very close to my heart. Uh, first, we can start with the introduction. Uh, <coughs> if you don't mind, I would like to show you uh, some pictures about my my city and about my, my university. And I would like to convince you to come to study to our university. It will take only uh, five minutes. Uh, we have an Erasmus contract with, uh, between Brno University and and uh, Pace, so it is a it is a freely available possibility for you to to come to our university to study. Um, personally, me, I'm living in in Budapest. I'm working in the National Library, but my main job is in Pace. It is in the southeast uh, Hungary. Um, Budapest is on the middle way between Brno and Pécs. Pécs takes for me three hours of uh, train trip. Uh, Brno takes four hours, so it is almost uh, in the middle um, where I live. Uh, Pécs city was the European capital of culture in 2010, so it is a, it is a very cultural city. Uh, it is uh, full of students and it is full of uh, built heritage. We have a big library here. 
uh, it is uh, open in the in the European uh, capital of cultural project. Uh, in this new library, we are very proud of that. We also have some ancient heritage here. This is a, a cemetery for the for the ancient ancient uh, Christians. Uh, this is the main square. This is the cathedral. So it is a very nice city, and it is worth to uh, to see it uh, at least. If you are deciding to come to the University of Pech, you need to keep in mind that it is the first. It used to be, or it was the first university of um, of Hungary. Uh, it was founded in uh, 1367. The only problem that it was closed a year after. Uh, it was founded by Louis the Great. Uh, have you heard about this king? We have uh, two types of kings. Uh, we have who captured uh, the, the Czech uh, part. Or we could have a Czech king in Hungary. Or we both have kings, but they were enemies. I don't know what is the, the situation with Louis the Great, but he was really great. Uh, he had all the countries around us, so he was also a Polish king, and he was uh, he, uh, he occupied a lot of space in uh, in Italy and so on. So it was, uh, he was uh, really great, and he founded uh, a university. And afterwards, we uh, it, it was closed, certain, so there was not uh, so big uh, attendance. But we are very proud that we, it was the first. The number of students are uh, quite high, so it is, uh, the city is like Renault, it is full of students, um, and we have a lot of foreign students as well, especially in the medical, uh, in the medical studies, but uh, also in, in other uh, sciences, because we have altogether 10 faculties, and among that, adult education and human resources development faculty is where the library and information science department uh, is. Uh, but we also have a faculty of humanities, arts, law, medicine, technology, so you can study what you want in our uh, university. Why students love us? Uh, because uh, we have more than a friendly environment. In this respect, we are a little bit better than the Masaryk University, but in any, in any other respect, we, are, uh, we have a relatively lower standard. Um, we have a very close student-teacher relationship. It's a very small department. <coughs> Ours. Uh, we have a practice-oriented education. We use this uh, newly built big library for uh, practice of the students, and um, and uh, that's why this um, yeah, this practice orient is, is is quite important in our in our uh, in our uh, courses. Okay, so this was the introduction of uh, of my uh, university, and uh, hopefully I could convince you to to come. Okay, uh, let's speak about a little bit uh, digitization. And in the in the last, last part of this uh, lecture, you will uh, I will speak about um, uh, digitization. Um, I have a sentence here, and I don't know if you agree or not agree. I said that digitization is easy. Do you agree with it? Or how many of you agree with it? Please raise your hand. Nobody. <laughs> Nobody? <clears throat> Any? No? 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 So digitization is not easy, you think? <laughs> or you are not as active, or you, you don't uh, have so much trust in me, so I. I uh, you are a little bit afraid of me. Uh, hopefully, you will not uh, in a few minutes. So I said that uh, digitization is quite easy. When you would like to digitize one page in a book, you have all the technical stuff available for digitizing the material. Um, and the only problem is that uh, it is the general view on digitization in the public. So the public thinks that digitization is about scanning books. Is it true? More or less it is. It is about scanning books, but we need to find the, the problematic things in, in other fields. Uh, 
What do you think? What was the profession of the person who said this? The Hungarian cultural heritage can be digitized within no more than two weeks. What was the, the profession of this dummy? The secretary said it. Yeah. Politician. Hmm? Politician. Yes, uh, thank you very much. It is an anonymous politician. I don't want to name him. Um, politicians think that uh, digitizing cultural heritage is quite an easy thing. Because we need to scan the books. And we have a project in Hungary which was also founded by uh, politicians, which is uh, about scanning the, ma the material. We have a, a new system uh, when all, all uh, people who doesn't have work, they can get social benefits if they are uh, doing some social work. Yeah? They, are working some, they are working for the public. And uh, these people were used for, for digitizing material and we have uh, an institutions who use, who use these people and they are somehow uh, doing quite useful things. They are, uh, but it is not so effective when they are scanning these things. But they are doing something work and that's why they get their, their social benefits. But this is how the politicians are, are thinking about uh, digitization. But what is not easy? So this is, this is what is easy, scanning some pages. What is not easy is finding out what to do exactly. And we, have, uh, we can pose a lot of questions about it. For example, what to digitize? You could ask, what is the cultural heritage that, we, that is needed to be digitized? The next question is how to digitize? What to do exactly? Um, what kind of formats that we need to, to, to make at, at the end? So digitization is about uh, creating from analog documents the digitized documents, but we, we need to find out, for example, what resolution do we need? Or we need to uh, find out the formats which will be uh, durable for the future uh, decades or for the future uh, few hundreds of years, if we can target a few hundreds of years. Or who digitize? What is the expertise that we need for digitizing? It is also a good question. Another question, what is the purpose of digitization? Uh, who will use uh, these dig this digitized content? What is our target group? And uh, how can these uh, digitized documents uh, will be uh, used? And what we will uh, speaking about much more in this uh, in this seminar, I'm very sorry that this will be much more a lecture than a seminar because Paula told me that relatively many of students are coming and uh, that's why we can't work uh, so closely. But if you don't mind, we, we have to, to make a, a lecture then. Do you know what does it mean sustainability? Everybody knows it. What is sustainability? Please uh, tell it in Czech because it is a key word, sustainability. Hmm? Please, again. I, I, can't, I can't repeat it. <laughs> yeah. So, so to, to, uh, there are a lot of uh, public debates around sustainability, and it's uh, much more in the general public, it is much more about um, economic friendly developments or green energy or something like that. So, this is the sustainable development, development that you are usually speaking about, but it is an economic sustainability. How can we sustain it economically? How can we uh, ensure that we will always have money for digitization and we, uh, we can sustain these developments uh, in the future? The next uh, few ideas about it generally in, about digitization is that it means different things in different sectors. Uh, if you think about the audiovisual materials or the film heritage, digitization is uh, very important for preserving material. Because you have a lot of films 
in different formats and you will and we will lose these material in the near future and that's why we need to digitally reproduce them and this is what the film community and the audiovisual community targets. The library community wants a little bit different things. The uh, library community wants, to, wants uh, to ensure access, free access to information. This is our, if you are a librarian, all of you, or library information studies, you are uh, attending uh, this, this course. Uh, so we can speak about, we are librarians. So we librarians, we are thinking uh, about uh, digitization as we would like to, to give access. To, uh, free access to information. This is our historic mission to give access to, to everything. And the museum community wants much uh, different things. They want uh, uh, spectacular things. They want to entertain people. They want uh, curated content. They want uh, virtual exhibitions and help uh, the community, the education communities. And, and that's why they need a huge amount of digital material. And the archive community, just think about the family who are researching their families. What do they need? They need to have their grandparents in one database, and their grandparents in another one, and the grand grand grandparents in another, a third one, and they need links between these. They need to, to they need digitized content, and they need data which is uh, um, highly usable for discovery. So it is a, it's a very complicated uh, field and uh, this uh, field needs to be handled uh, in different ways. The next uh, bunch of uh, ideas will be about the European Union uh, policies. Um, what kind of expert I am. Uh, I'm a member of this member states expert group on digitization and digital preservation. It is a, it is a group of experts and uh, we are meeting each other in Luxembourg and twice a year and all the member states are represented by one or two or three people but only one is paid that's why in Western countries more people are coming from the Eastern states. Sometimes nobody is coming. So this is a, this is the difference between the East and West. It's still remaining this uh, difference between countries. <coughs> and so I'm not a, a too big expert, but I'm I'm the Hungarian member of this of this group, and I have some insights. I I, I have some view on what is happening on the European level and that's why what I can speak about to you is, um, is a strategic level of thinking around uh, digitization. So this is what uh, I will speak about in this and some core ideas that uh, the European Union uh, has uh, about the digitization. First of uh, all about this member states expert group. We have three uh, main objectives. One is to monitor the progress, progress of implementation of the Commission recommendation of October 2011 on digitization and digital preservation. So the European Commission had a um, recommendation for all the member states what to do in the field of digitization and digital preservation. Some member states like it, some others uh, not as much like it, but uh, it is a recommendation what you can implement if you want. And, uh, the main target or the main aim of this, this group is to, is to see around in the different member states what they are doing in uh, the field of digitization. The next thing is to exchange information good practices. So if somebody in, in one member state finds out something, we can use it in another member state. And that's why we are exchanging our ideas. This is the other. Uh, important thing and the last one this is the most important for us because we are speaking about the sustainability uh, I don't know it in Czech I still don't know it in Czech what is in Czech? Udržitelnost <laughs> ah. Udržitelnost 
<laughs> this is the same Luke. Uh, Luke Thomas. Um, so uh, the third thing is about more or less it is about business. It is about monitoring developments regarding the way cultural digital resources can be innovatively reused to offer economic opportunities to cultural and creative industries. So behind this there is an assumption that the digitized content can be usable in the business sector. And if in the business sector it can be used, you can make money from the cultural heritage. And if you want to make something sustainable economically, you need to make money from it. So this is, uh, this is the, in short, this is the core message of my uh, presentation. Some core ideas about the EU policies. Uh, there are lots of core ideas. These are ju just uh, three uh, things about, just to, to, to have a little insight about what's happening. Making available the European cultural heritage. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a mission. Yeah? Uh, it is not about sustainability, it's, it's just a mission. That you, we would like to see it in digitized all the cultural heritage which is available in, in the European Union countries. Next one is joint efforts. We, need to, we would like to do it together and we would like to make it uh, sustainable. Make, make it sustainable and creating an information ecosystem which is uh, sustainable for longer years. Uh, let's see the first one. It is about uh, making the European cultural heritage available uh, digitizing as much as possible. Do you have ideas about how much of the Czech content is available in digitized? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Me too. I, I, I don't know it. I know that there are big differences in the European countries. For example, uh, in the Norwegian National Library, uh, they, the guy who is working there, he told me that no, we are not ready with digitization. We will be ready within two years because 80%, 80% is digitized from Norwegian cultural heritage. As far as the library is concerned, the National Library's collections, 80% is digitized. The same in the Hungarian National Library is 1%. Uh, so we have uh, very much space for development. It's a nice uh, situation that we can we can have space for, for, for doing things. Um, the next uh, thing which, is, which can be important is preservation. Uh, because there are, usually there are two main uh, directions in digitization. One is about preservation. We want to digitize to preserve our content. The next is to create cool services. Cool services which people like it. They can share it on Facebook. It is uh, not so cool anymore. Okay, okay, but uh, they can do something with it. Uh, and another um, idea, which is quite important in the in the European Union policies, is overcoming the legal constraints. Um, it's a quite important part. So I I will speak a little bit more about this. So there are three different types of. No, oh, four, four different types of content. There is one that it's just public domain. What is public domain? Public domain when the author died 70 years ago. You are familiar with this, with the copyright. There is which is copyright protected and with, within the copyright protected material there are two other groups. There are the orphan works. Do you know what are the orphan works? These are if you don't know who is the author, you would like to pay somebody, but you don't know who to pay. Uh, and the third is the out of commerce work. When you know who is the author, you would like to pay for him, but he doesn't, he or she doesn't expect money for their work because it is out of commerce. For example, um, more or less, it is me. I'm an out-of-commerce author. I write, I write an article, I don't expect money for my articles. 
Uh, I'm not a writer. I'm not living on on uh, on, on writing uh, novels. Um, and these are legal constraints that doesn't let you uh, use or reuse content. It is a very important part. I want I don't want to speak about uh, these issues because it is a very uh, big thing. But uh, we need to keep in mind that it is also a challenge. Joint efforts, the biggest joint effort of the European Union uh, in the field of cultural heritage is Europeana. Are you familiar with Europeana? Who have heard about it? Raise hands. Yeah, most of you have uh, heard about Europeana. It is, uh, I have a definition from Wikipedia, an internet portal that acts as an interface to millions of books, etc. etc. Um, it was uh, created by six um, uh, prime ministers in, uh, as far as I know, in 2005 and no, 2007. Oh, please don't record it. I, I, I don't remember it. Uh, but the Hungarian prime minister was there. So uh, the Hungarian prime minister was one of these. Are there Polish in this group? No. Uh, Czechs and Slovaks, yeah? No, neither the Czech and nor the Slovakian Prime Minister was not there. Uh, but the Hungarian and the Polish was there. Uh, so they uh, decided to create this uh, kind of internet library or internet cultural heritage institution where all the, uh, all the national heritage of the different countries are aggregated and are made available uh, in a common uh, in a common way, and Europeana is the result of this uh, effort. Uh, there is also a very important part of it to build a European identity. It's a very difficult question to, to how to, to, to create a European identity because we are separate nations. We have their own identity, and in the European Union level, we should have a European ident identity too. So we have some core values which uh, we have, and uh, Maybe Europeana can help us to create uh, this identity or this level of identity uh, in, on a European uh, level. And Europeana has some satellite projects that I will show you later. We also have some joint projects in Europe uh, which have very different uh, ideas. For example, and these are also just ideas for some digitization projects. The European Film Gateway is about digitizing film heritage or aggregation projects, the, the European Library, have you heard about it? The European Library. It is um, uh, like Europeana, but in the Europeana uh, some tens of people are working, in the European Library there are only three as far as I know. Uh, they are aggregating the metadata from the national libraries. For Athena it is about the museum heritage which is, which is uh, aggregated. There are some metadata projects, the link, linked heritage, it is about semantic web developments and uh, we have also research projects, Enumerate, I will uh, show you some results of the, uh, the Enumerate uh, project. And the third thing about, um, from the core ideas are, is about uh, creating a sustainable information ecosystem. It is the most important part of my uh, presentation and the most uh, and the first thing is to, to create a sustainable information ecosystem is to find out what are the needs of the different uh, user groups. Uh, what kind of user groups we have in the cultural heritage? We have the users. We say, we are the users. We are going to Europeana or to the Czech National Library and we want digitized content there. there there is the cultural heritage sector, it is another uh, user group. We use each other's material and we are creating material in a digitized format. And there are the creative industries, it is a very important part. Creative industry, this, this is the sector which makes money from the digitized content. Or we, or we hope that they will make money from our digitized content. And when we find out, when we found out what are our demands and needs, we need to cutter these needs. Uh, and to cutter these needs, we need to give them freely available content. 
we need to get them to use it and we need to get them to reuse our uh, our content we will uh, we will speak about uh, this part much more uh, in details than about the others uh, but first of all let's just see some partner sectors just to see why uh, these uh, creative reuse of this information ecosystem what uh, it is about you think that creative industry is a, is a very small uh, part but it is about education, tourism, research, creative industries. These are those partner sectors that European identified when they uh, made available their digitized content and when they are thinking on strategic level on the use of the material that they made available. Just uh, take a look about, let's just take a look on the tourism thing. Do you know what it is? It is in the uh, Femme Parisien. Uh, in family, uh, with uh, uh, a girl, a young man, or a man, a little bit serious, uh, like uh, people. So this is the cultural tourism, which is uh, which is quite important for us. The cultural tourism. Uh, people are going to famous sites and they are making selfies. I am with. Uh, to Rafael, or no, they have a selfie uh, sticker. Yeah. Or I'm on the, where, where I am? In, the, in Prague, in a certain place, or in Brno, in the cathedral, in the Spielberg, or, or somewhere, and they are publishing it. And cultural tourism is the, the biggest part of tourism. It makes a lot of money for Europe. Because we Europeans, we like culture. We like looking around in different cities. We like making selfies about ourselves and publish it to show others that we have been at uh, uh, Eiffel Tower or somewhere else. And there are other partner sectors also in this uh, information ecosystem that is, is needed to uh, be developed. For example, the education. Um, all this digitized material can be used in educational purposes or for research purposes and we will see also the creative industry. Some figures about digitization. We spoke about uh, EU policies and we had this enumerate project. Uh, it is... Um, enumerate project was uh, led by a um, consortium of uh, Ten uh, institutions. There were private companies in it, and uh, also the Hungarian National Library was uh, participating in this annual project. And the main, uh, the main uh, objective of this this project was to create community uh, who are collecting data on digitization. Uh, the other objective was to uh, develop a methodology how to measure digitization uh, we also made coordinated surveys uh, these surveys were very very big surveys there was one qualitative and two quantitative surveys all over Europe here you can see the activity of the different nations you can't see so well do you see that uh, the dark uh, the dark uh, Parts are, those were, were very active, so the Spanish, uh, Slovenians, uh, Lithuanians, they were very active, the Swedish, we Hungarians and uh, Czechs, we are on the same level. The less active were the French uh, colleagues and Bulgaria, from Bulgaria we didn't get any data, but from France we got one, one heritage institution field in the, in the question, and finally when we got the French, the French answer, everybody was very happy. Uh, Germans and Spanish, they were very, 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 very keen. Uh, and finally, the, 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 the next uh, objective of this project was to, to create some normalized data and intelligence. I will show you a, a website, the enmerit.eu uh, website. You can find all the results of, of the um, of this uh, service and you can see what is happening uh, in figures. 
in, um, in, in the European uh, digitization uh, landscape. And in 2015, we started the third uh, survey. If somebody is working in a library, maybe you have met uh, this uh, survey altogether. 2,000 heritage institutions filled in our questionnaire all over Europe. So it was a, um, it was a relatively big uh, amount of data, data that we could collect. This was the group. Uh, it was taken in the Vienna Public Library, or Vienna National Library, uh, who finds me on this uh, picture, he, he or she is getting a job. Uh, I'm here, so I'm get a job. Um, so some, some figures about uh, digitization. <coughs> Just to see what is happening in, in this, this way. For example, uh, there is a huge amount of huge amount of, of data. It is 70 pages. The report of one survey, and it is an aggregated data. So it is a quite big uh, amount of, of, of uh, data. The digital collections and digital strategy. This is the percentage of institutions with digital collection. This is the blue one, the blue line. The red line is the percentage uh, of those institutions who are having written digitization uh, strategy. So we can see that, for example, the monument care institutions, 100% uh, are uh, having um, digital co uh, collection and none of them have a strategy on digitization. Uh, libraries, museums, archives, audiovisual institutions, these are the participated in, in this, uh, in this uh, data collection, in this, this research. The next thing is the digitization process. progress. What, what amount of, uh, of our uh, data is available uh, uh, digitized? Who are, who are lagging behind are the libraries. The blue is who has been digitally reproduced. Uh, so the, the whole line is the collection. The blue is that we have already digitized the red. We would like to digitize it. And the yellow, not to be digitized. We don't want to digitize it uh, for some reason. We can see that libraries are lagging behind because in the libraries, digitization is a very hard process. Uh, it is a huge amount of pages that we need to, to, to be digitized and if you would like to digitize it on a, on a normal uh, uh, level, uh, we need to use this OCR technology and so on. So it is uh, quite a big work. Uh, it's a little bit less work in the, in the museums. How the museums are digitizing their content? They're taking pictures on it taking pictures on uh, some uh, plates or some coins or something like that, what, what they, they have in their, their collections. So that's why they are uh, relatively in a better uh, situation in this respect. Uh, how, does it, how much does it cost? You see that audiovisual institutions, it costs a lot. The, the, the red is the structural cost, the blue is the incidental cost. But what is interesting is that the most uh, costly part is the audiovisual institutions. The next is the libraries and uh, the museums. For the museums, it is not, uh, it, it doesn't need uh, so much uh, financial efforts for digitizing their content because you have a big painting. What to do? How, how to digitize a big painting? You need to take a picture on it. Yeah? Is it easy? Yes, it is. But for digitizing the book, yeah, it is a big work. Even if you have a, a, a robot scanner, it, is, it takes some time. So that's why there are differences in costs. And what is also interesting is the access options. Uh, there is emerging openness in the in, in the field. What well, in this uh, these lines? Is, these are the offline. It is uh, made available offline. Uh, the red is institu on institutional websites. 
the yellow is on national aggregators and so on. What, what, what is interesting for us is the third party API. If you, if you made available your content in, in a third party's application uh, or an institutional application, there are other greens that Europe Ana. Uh, these are maybe the, the most important because if you are digitizing, you have to make it available for the people. And if you let to a third party to uh, to use it or to reuse it or to or to, or to for example or make business from it or to create a website and make it cooler by your digitized content, uh, this is the main aim, and this is what I will uh, speak about in the last, in the next few minutes. So it is emerging somehow. <coughs> About the whole um, landscape, um, it is the European cultural heritage, this uh, big hill of books, it represents them, the European cultural heritage, and 90% of it is not digitized. Only 10% is digitized, it means uh, 300 million objects. And if we see that 10% uh, from the 10%, uh, only 12% is available in the Europeana. You know how Europeana works. Institutions are creating their digital reproductions and they are sending it to Europeana and Europeana uh, show it in, a, in new contexts. So this, this is what Europeana is about. So only 12% uh, is available in, in uh, Europeana and if you see that how open these data, we can see that uh, this is this green one from the Europe, this, this represents the Europeana uh, collection and this uh, dark green, it means this percent is what is reusable objects. So this is what you can use for freely for, for business purposes, for example, or for any other purposes that, that you need. So this is, a, the culture, this is the part of the cultural heritage that you can use for, for what you want. From the Europeana. Uh, this part is which is available in Europeana, but it is pro protected somehow. So you, you can't uh, share it with, with your own if you are interested, if you want. So this is the landscape uh, of uh, digitization, and finally, I promised you to show you a website on uh, the Enumerate website. <coughs> Enumerate. Uh, project created a benchmark tool and if you if you write in how uh, much have you have digitized in, in your institution uh, you can uh, compare it with the same types of institutions and you can compare it with the country in which you are or with other countries or if it's what you want so what percentage of your collection is already digitized uh, digitized, we write here, for example, one percent, because my library uh, uh, has a lot of space for development. And what percentage of your collection remains to be digitized? It is the remaining part, uh, for example, eighty percent. What we would like to do it, and finally we will uh, we will get uh, benchmark data from uh, the same types of institutions and from from the same country from the same country. So this was the landscape. This was the, the place where, where we are now. The next thing will be uh, the use and reuse of, of content. What I'm uh, thinking about use and, and reuse and why it is important. I will speak about the creative industry and afterwards I will speak about European again because European is very important for us and it's close to my heart too and hopefully it will close to your heart as well. 
uh, or it will be close to your heart after this presentation. Uh, I spoke about sustainability. We have a lot of projects for digitizing content. We have aggregation projects. Uh, we have research projects and very different projects to make all the, all the European cultural heritage available um, online and, and, and uh, get, it, get it used. But what is necessary? What is necessary is to identify the needs and after cutter these needs, fulfill these needs. Uh, the politicians who are thinking that within two weeks the culture, the Hungarian cultural heritage can be digitized, they think that culture is very important. Politicians are always saying that uh, culture is very important. It is and it is good. And what is not good, that they always have found something which is even more important than culture. Because they have a limited amount of money that they can spend on different purposes, and they always think uh, that yes, culture is very important, and we love libraries, we love museums, we love culture, but unfortunately we don't have money for it, uh, just a very few amount. That's why what we need to do is to find clear arguments. Why do we need these processes? Why do we need digitized content? Uh, and it is usually clear for us, but it is not clear for everybody. We need to convince them. Um, and just see um, the Europeanas um, example. What are they living on? They are living from the member states' contributions. It is not obligatory. The member states can decide that they support Europeana. But the member state, in the member states there are politicians, and the politicians can't convince uh, their voters, I spent your money to a common European project, yeah, you are voters. Just, uh, just imagine it. That you, you paid in the taxes, and I use your taxes for a common European project. I sent it to the Netherlands. It is not a, not a too reasonable. And the one third of the Europeana's expenditure is uh, from the member states' contributions. And from the member states, the most active is the Netherlands. Because the European headquarters are in the Netherlands. And that's why they think that it is important for them. Once in Luxembourg, in, this, uh, in a meeting of the member states expert group, there was a question uh, for us. Um, who owns Europeana? Who is the owner of the Europeana? And if you think it over, it is a very difficult question. What, would, what we say, it is the European citizens, it is the European member states, it is uh, the European commissions, uh, because who has... Um, hi. Hi. Uh, because if you have something, you have to maintain it. If you have a car, you have to fill it with petrol. Or if you have a, a flat, you have to maintain it. You, you have to paint it. Not the neighbor, you. And this is the question, who owns Europeana? And if you find it, who owns it, you will find who should pay for it. Um, and today there is a European Commission's grant, which is two-thirds of the amount that they are living on, but the European Commission don't want to uh, finance it anymore or at, at this level. Because the European Commission says that it is for the member states, it is for you, it's not mine, it is ours. Yeah? But what is ours? It is nobody's. Yeah? 
Yeah, we are in Eastern Europe. We have a lot of experiences in it. Yeah. What is common? It is uh, it is ours, but I don't want to play it with somebody else. Yeah. And uh, very little amount of uh, money is coming from the business sector. What we need, uh, what should be necessary, to come a little bit bigger part from the business sector. Okay, uh, what it is about? Use and reuse of digitized content. What does it mean? Use means direct use. You are going to a heritage institution's website and uh, and use the content. You see the Mona Lisa electronically. Um, it is good uh, somehow, but it is not enough. Because for this, it is not uh, necessary for digitizing the whole European cultural heritage. If some people want to, to, to use and look some things. Uh, but it can be used for education, entertainment, research, and so on. And the next term is reuse. What, what do we mean on, on a reuse? Reuse means that we are creating something new, we are creating a new interpretation, or we are putting all the things into new contexts. This is reuse. And what is the problem? The problem is that we saw a few slides ago that this part is only the reusable content, the small part, because the others, the other parts, are not available for free. It is just for, just for seats, not for use, just for the eyes, not for the hands. Uh, and in this, uh, Context, we can see the creative industry. What, what is the, the creative industry? The creative industry is, the, is, is that uh, sector of business that wants to create something new from the digitized content. And the creative industry wants a lot of digitized content. And what, are, what do they want? They would like to make business, they would like to make money from this, uh, from this uh, digitized content. Um, just as an example, let's see how European uh, identified its target groups. Um, so there are three types of services, what they decided. One is the end user services, and what an end user, an, an end user want, we will see. There are the data partner services, who are the data partners? They are the heritage institutions, museums, libraries, archives, audiovisual institutions, and so on. So they, they are the, and the, the, the reuser services, or, or no, they, they are the data partners, and they are the reuser services, and these are the creatives. They, they are who would like to do something new, something cool with their, uh, with their European content or with the digitized content. Uh, let's see a little bit more details of these uh, sector. So let's see the end users, what they want. What an end user want? End user want, uh, what he says? You, you can't uh, read it, it's too far, is it? It says, I want reliable information for my thesis on migration. I'm looking for images from the World War I. Uh, or I want to share stuff on Facebook. This is what the um, end user wants. Um, he would like to use uh, this material. Um, just a few words about this uh, World War I project. Uh, Europan started to collect the um, heritage all over Europe from the, um, this is the oral history heritage all over Europe from the World War One, because we have a certain distance from the World War One, we don't have the same distance from the Second World War. It is much more painful to speak about the Second World War, especially in the older generation. But the, the First World War, so more or less everybody died who 
who, who was there or who have some memories about it. And that's why we can speak about it. And uh, this project was uh, very interesting for building this European identity because, for example, the French and Germans could speak together about painful questions because we, they have a certain distance. So this is what an end user wants. The next group, they are the, no, the next group should be the professionals. What the professionals want, I try to read what this professional says. I want statistic oh, okay. uh, for I want statistics about the use of my collection. The next, what he, what he said, I want to meet uh, colleagues in meetings around Europe. So this is another uh, kind of data partner service, how they can, can uh, define their, their services. And what, how they define the reuser services, what the reuser service want. Uh, I want to use open data for development of my app. So this this creative, it is a lady, ladies are always creatives than men. Uh, this lady wants open data for for her app for her application. And you want to what do you want? Uh, I, w I want to mix mix heritage content on my website. This is what she wants. So this, uh, this is, these are the different user groups what, uh, which are existing in, uh, around uh, Europe and these are the needs, how they, uh, what they identified and what they need to cater uh, in the future. So this was... Uh, um, So we spoke about the, generally about digitization. We spoke about some figures around digitization. We spoke about uh, use and reuse. What does it mean, use and reuse? And finally, and if, if you understood why it is necessary to reuse, wait, I it's clear why is it necessary to reuse this content, Lukas? Is it because you know, yes. you, you know, for me because we <laughs> spoke about it for one hour, but uh, for for everybody, is is it uh, is it clear? So what uh, what is necessary uh, to to know this digitized content? Nobody wants to pay. Yeah, who wants to pay? Mm -hmm. It is the, the general thing. We need to convince people that it is relevant, what, what we are doing, how we can convince them, we can convince them if we or they or somebody can make money from it. Is it clear? If it's not a problem, if it is not me who make money. It is enough if somebody make money from my content. This is a, it is a very difficult question. For example, in the Enumerate project, we, we identify that a huge amount of digitized uh, data is not available for reuse. But the institutions don't want to make business on their own from this digitized content. Because it, is, it also could be an approach. To, and I digitize something and I sell it to people. But, for example, the National Library, or any National Library, can't sell it. Or they don't want to sell it. But if they don't sell it, they should let it for reuse, for others. So if I, if I can't make money and I'm poor, I can let others to, to be rich. Yes, this is the this this, this is the the point. This is what we need. Okay, 
Uh, in the last part of uh, this presentation, I will show you some examples from uh, creative reuse of uh, digitized content. And finally, we will uh, try to draw up the map of needs. Who wants what? And how to cutter these, these needs. But this will be a very far uh, site and so it, it, it won't be uh, uh, so detailed model. Use and reuse of digitized content. Let's uh, see first the mobilized, mobile, mobilized content. Because uh, I'm not sure that this word is existing in English, but uh, everybody understands it. What is mobilized content? So we, 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 we are, when we are creating application, this uh, mobile applications from the digitized content. Uh, the first uh, example is uh, you can see on the upper right corner uh, of this slide. It is a map, and it is a cultural tour at the site of of a certain novel, a Hungarian novel. It is created by a Hungarian museum. Uh, a literary museum, and they process they processed a novel, which is happening in Budapest, and you can go to to the city, and you can read the novel on the street, on your mobile, to or your on your mobile phone or on your tablet, or or you can uh, hear it. <laughs> and you can uh, take a tour in, in Budapest. And you are always in the same site where something is happening. There are a lot of challenges in this, uh, in this project. One is that in one point, uh, the user has to take the tram. And when they tried it, they recognized that they don't hear anything because the Hungarian trams are certainly very well-kept trends, but it is a little bit louder than, than nothing. Yeah. And uh, they, they couldn't hear. They, they have to uh, uh, volume up this application uh, that, that time. Another thing is uh, we have a famous poet, so he is the national poet, and I'm not sure that you have heard about Sándor Petőfi. Um, it is like <coughs> Adam Mickiewicz for the Polish, it is from the Romantic, uh, romantic uh, era. And there is a museum guide on mobile phone that you can download in, in the museum. But what was interesting that uh, it, it was created for a um, for a mobile uh, app and this is for creating for on-site use. But people downloaded it from Australia. Hungarians who were living in, in Australia, they downloaded it. So then, then the museum and then the colleagues in the museum recognized that it is, it can be used not only in, within the museum, it can be used everywhere. It is about this, uh, this poet. Um, what is necessary for these uh, applications? What is necessary? Huge amount of freely available cultural content. And who can make it? Creative industry can make it. Um, the next one is a Latvian uh, example. It is a fairy tale application for kids. Kids uh, don't, can't read. This is the problem of, of who are, kids are, they like fairy tales, but they can't read, and that's why they're always hanging on you, who will uh, read them, the fairy tales. And a Latvian company defined this, this need and created a fairy tale application when the kids have to shake the mobile phone and they can get a new fairy tale. So if it is boring for them, what is, uh, what is on, they can shake the mobile phone and uh, a new is coming. 
I think it's quite cute. Uh, the next thing is uh, also a Latvian company who made... Um, in Latvia, people like singing. Have you heard about the, the great traditions of the Baltic states when they, they are singing? Uh, the communities are, are usually quite uh, strong in this, these Baltic states. Because of history, it is one, one thing, and otherwise uh, these are very small nations, and, and that's why uh, it is important for them. And the singing tradition is, is quite, uh, quite important. And this Latvian company created a, a song a, a book with uh, famous songs. And people in the pub can download the same application and they can sing together if they forgot the, the text of a certain song. What is necessary for this? Huge amount of digitized content which is freely available. What you can reuse for free. And the next question of mine, uh, how the economy will profit from, for example, this museum guide, from this museum guide? Why uh, somebody will pay for a museum guide? Yeah, maybe some, but no, not, not so much. But why it is necessary to have such things? Because it makes our country cool. <laughs> because they are coming to Budapest. And they see that oh, there we are full of different mobile apps that I can use when I'm coming here. And I tell the others that this city is worth to visit. And who pays? He pays, but not for the mobile app. He's paying for the hotel room. And they are paying for, the, for, for other services. For the tram tickets. And for, for the, uh, the restaurant. The next bunch of examples uh, is from the educational purposes. Both projects that I, uh, I will show you are from around the Europeana. The one, uh, one is uh, from Inventing Europe. Have you heard about Inventing Europe? If you not, you can uh, type in uh, www.inventingeurope.eu. It's quite easy. Uh, it is uh, cooperation between the European Technology Museums and uh, they created curatorship guided tours uh, and you can uh, see around for example if you are very keen on the trains you can explore what is about trains in Europe and you can uh, you can follow this guided tour uh, on Inventing Europe website on, on the trains uh, and they also created a space for collaboration, uh, uh, so you can comment uh, these um, things. Yeah, it is quite uh, an average demand that you you need to that you want to, to comment things. And uh, you can also make your own guided tour. So if you are if you are interested in in something on laptops or on cameras, you can. You can, uh, you can make your own uh, guide to it. The next one is quite interesting, Historiana. Have you heard about it? Historiana.eu, this is the website. Uh, it, is, um, it is a historic approach, also for education. And it is also a little bit about creating your common identity. Just uh, think it over. How many conflicts are there in Central Eastern Europe? There was a Hungarian historian who wrote a book about the different conflicts around, around the different nations in Central Europe. And he made a reg register about why, what is the, the core message of the content of the conflict between the Romanians and the Hungarians, or the uh, Ukrainians and the Romanians, and the Serbs and Romanians, because everybody had conflicts with the others.
nutritional purposes. So if you if you would like to 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 know uh, Central Eastern Europe's history, you can use Historiana. What is necessary for for creating inventing Europe and Historiana projects? You need huge amount of digitized data which is freely available and which is reusable. 